All right, welcome back to another show, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're having a wonderful day as always. <clears throat> Real quick, like, share, subscribe, do all that good stuff that helps out the show. I really do appreciate it, uh, especially sharing. You can follow me on Twitter and TikTok at MB Freethinker. On Facebook and YouTube, Manitoba Freethinker Podcast. Um, if you want to send me an email, that's mbfreethinker at gmail.com. Or you can go to my website, mbfreethinker.wordpress.com. Or you can go to any um, podcast player and you can get all my um, episodes there. All right, though, Manitoba. What a weekend it was. And, um, like, if you only follow the mainstream media, I'm sure you probably think that I'm referring to uh, the Fringe Festival or Folklorama. But I'm um, talking about... The Winnipeg Convoy uh, that was in support of the Dutch farmers. It was a pretty amazing turnout. For those who are unaware, uh, the convoy took place on Saturday, July 23rd, uh, like this past Saturday. It uh, started at 1230 at the Flying J in Headingley. It made its way through the city past the ledge, and it was nice seeing the semis back at the ledge. I got to say that. Um, continued on uh, through to the south perimeter and made its way all the way to Clandeboy, um, where the organizer Bonnie or Anarchy uh, lives. I got footage from the convoy um, in the city and uh, around the province, or sorry, around the perimeter. I didn't make it out to Clandeboy, but I did check out some videos and some photos, and it it was a pretty good turnout. It looks like. But just so you guys know, the convoy, like I said, was in support of the Dutch farmers who are protesting uh, in the Netherlands um, to their government reducing the use of fertilizer. And like I said, if you follow the mainstream media, you, you would have no idea because they do not cover this at all. But um, basically, like they're following the climate action plan, like the guidelines given out by the WEF, like Charles Schwab and all those people. But Manitoba, the Dutch, like, they they took, they they basically um, saw what the Canadian trucker convoy did this past winter, and they took it and ran with it. Um, I encourage you guys to Google it or YouTube it or whatever, because um, like I said, it won't be on the mainstream media, but they took it to the next level. Like, they're setting hay bales on fire. They're driving their farm tractors and equipment to the government buildings and they're spraying manure like it's crazy to see but uh, like i'm saying i'm sure a lot of you listening probably were at the event or at least seen videos or photos on facebook so you know what i'm talking about you know that it was a pretty good turnout i think there was maybe like i, I don't know i think around 100 vehicles there was about four or five tractors about 10 semis and there was tons of like you know just Proud, ordinary Canadians. Like, tons of Canadian flags. It, it was... I don't know. It was nice to see. But uh, I think the convoy in total took about eight hours. So, shout out to those farmers and those truckers who showed up once again. Um, those those people, those men and women, they rock. They're truly amazing. Um, I bitch about putting gas in my car. And they went on an eight-hour convoy in the semi. Like, imagine how much what that looked like. Like, how much uh, the price tag that looked like. That Like, sh shout out to those truckers and farmers. Um, I, I don't know. I was really impressed. And, I mean, shout out to everyone else who showed up, too, in support of the farmers and truckers who brought their vehicles. Um, and all the people on the sidelines who honked and waved and showed their love. Um, I think it helps... It gives those uh, farmers and truckers a reason to do it, as long as Winnipeggers and Manitobans keep showing their love. But either way, Manitoba, that brings me to the point of the show. Uh, the mainstream media, like the title says, is not your friend. And really, neither are your our current elected officials. Like, whether they agree, whether our media agrees or not with the convoy, which they clearly don't, or, sorry, with the protest, um... They can at least mention it. Like, it was an eight-hour convoy that went throughout our city with, like, over 100 vehicles. And, like I said, like, 10 semis and four tractors. 
Like, you don't think people in Winnipeg would be wondering what's going on? CBC was there. I mean, they were there very shortly, but they were there. And nothing. Like, I, I maybe I missed it, but I, I looked and I didn't see any write-ups or any articles about uh, the the convoy that took place in support of the Dutch farmers. Nothing. Like, I did nothing from CB or CTV, Global News. Like, they don't even show what's taking place in the Netherlands and, like, how crazy it's getting and even what they're protesting, what the Dutch are actually protesting for. So, I mean, of course, they're not going to show us you know, Canadians supporting the Dutch. Because if they showed that, then they're going to be like, hey, why, what are the Canadians, like, why are the Dutch protesting? And it's just going to make Canadians ask questions, and they don't want that. Because, like, they would realize, like, more and more Canadians are going to realize that these are government-imposed sanctions. The Like, this doesn't have to take place. They just, but the media and our government right now, they want to sell you on the narrative, um, Russia, Russia, Russia. That's it. The high, I mean, It used to be COVID, but now it's only Russia. High gas prices, high food prices, um, soon to be food shortages, all because of Russia. I mean, it's clear as day that... Um, the, it's the, these are government imposed sanctions. So if you guys have been paying attention to what's going on in the in the Netherlands, uh, like buckle up because this stuff is coming to Canada for sure. Like it's coming. But before I get into uh, why across Canada, this didn't just happen in Manitoba. This happened in every province. Why there was so much support. For the Dutch farmers. And before I get into why the Dutch are even protesting. I'm going to show you what the mainstream media decided to cover instead. And like I said. I want to point out that CBC was there. So. But. Um, this is. This is like. This came out on the weekend. Winnipeg Death Doula provides care for the 2S LGBTQ community. Chosen family at end of life. Again, I don't care about that, but I just want to show you the theme of what CBC Manitoba thinks, how they should inform you of what's taking place in the province. Gender-diverse Manitobans face delays in getting changes to Manitoba health cards. And, more importantly, so they're willing to cover protests, small group takes to Manitoba legislator to protest Roe vs. Wade decision. So CBC Manitoba wants to cover a small group that's protesting Roe vs. Wade, uh, like a decision that's taking place, like um, doesn't even affect Canada. And before you say, well, why does the Netherlands affect Canada? Because food security affects the globe. Roe vs. Wade, which doesn't even stop abortion, that's what they're trying to scare you with, um, that um, the states is making abortion illegal and there's a possibility that could come to Canada. Roe vs. Wade does not make abortion illegal in the U.S., and there's no way that's coming to Canada. This is just to scare you. But they're willing to cover this small protest, a small handful of people, instead of covering like a hundred vehicle convoy that's protesting Dutch, you know, Dutch farmers. And they're going, like I said, they're going nuts. They're setting hay, hay bales on fire and everything. So... Excuse me. But the mainstream media, if you guys remember, they were so quick to like jump on board with the like the residential schools, which I've said a million times, residential schools are horrible. Um, but they were so quick to like turn everything orange and we support residential schools. They were so quick to support the Black Lives Matter riots in the States. And those were literally riots. And they were supporting it. And like I said, everyone had to turn their profile pic black. And now they are so quick to support Ukraine with no questions asked. And I mean support them with money, with weapons. We're, we're not sending them troops to fight, but we're sending them troops to train their troops. 
and also um, immigration. Like, no questions asked. It's just an open-door policy. And nothing on the Netherlands. No footage, no support, nothing. Like, our media has been doing their very best to, to, to like, shield you from seeing what's going on. And the thing is, like, they're, they, they're shielding you from basically the cause of the last two years. And, and I mean all of it. You know what I mean? Everything that had to do with COVID, the lockdowns, the financial stress, the um, like the emotional stress that families are going through right now, to what they're like, what's coming, which is food security, high price or food insecurity, I should say, and high prices. That's coming, and the mainstream media is doing their best to shield you from seeing that. Like it blows me away. And remember how fast they were to demonize. Any Canadian that just mentioned the word freedom during the convoy, right away you are a hateful Nazi, right away. Or if you just merely speaked out against Justin Trudeau and our government, the mainstream media would come out in full force and attack you with, like I said, whatever the trending word is, um, racist, misogynistic, you know, sp spreading hate, hate speech, anything to silence you and keep you from knowing the truth. But like I said, Manitoba... These the, the stuff that's going on in the Netherlands is coming to Canada. Like, it's not a matter of if, it's here. And the thing is, like, look at who, the article I pull up from foodingredientsfirst.com. Like, who the fuck are they? It's because the mainstream media, no one wants to talk about this. So this is the kind of, like, the, the website I got to go to just to find out what's going on. Uh, so it's titled, Less Fertilizer, Less Food. Canadian provinces protest Trudeau's fertilizer reduction target. In a comp uh, so it says, in a complex year for the agri sector, Canada plans to reduce 30% of its fertilizer by 2030 in order to meet climate targets. Climate targets he just made up, by the way. However, Saskatchewan and Alberta ministers of agriculture have expressed their profound disappointment in the Canadian federal government's arbitrary goal. Like, the very well put, arbitrary goal. And you notice how they say Saskatchewan and Alberta ministers? Where's my Manitoba minister? Heather? Hello? Like, we have farmers in Manitoba. Quote, this has been the most expensive crop anyone has put in following a very difficult year on the prairies, says Nate Horner, Alberta's minister of agriculture. Manitoba's agriculture minister, silent. Quote, the world is looking for Canada to increase production and be a solution to global food shortages. The federal government needs to display that they understand this. They owe it to our producers, he highlights. Alberta and Saskatchewan authorities are critical that fertilizer emission reductions was not even a topic on the agenda at the annual meeting of federal, provincial, territorial ministers of agriculture. Quote, provinces pushed the federal government to discuss this important topic. But we're disappointed to learn that the target is already set. That's what I mean. Like, it's already happening. Quote, the commitment to future consultations is only to determine how to meet the target that Prime Minister Trudeau and Minister Bibio have already unilaterally imposed on the industry. Not to consult on what is achievable or attainable. So the goal is Canada net zero by 2050. The Canadian federal government defends that reducing fertilizer use in Canada not to exceed its 2030 greenhouse gas emissions target and achieve net zero um, by 2050. Just give me one sec. Quote, we are continuing to support the development and adoption of practices and equipment that reduces um, greenhouse gas emissions and improve the sector's climate change resiliency. With the experience of fertilizer industry representatives, farmers and other pertinent groups can work together to identify concrete and innovative steps to help meet our targets, says Bibio, Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. So, like, non-farmers come up with this arbitrary goal, net zero by 2050, and now they want to meet with the farmers and say, hey, how do we do this without starving everyone? The government has announced that $550 million, 
over 10 years to help Canada's farmer meet its emission targets. A report from Fertilizer Canada explains how the fertilizer reduction will affect farmers' pockets. Quote, it is estimated that a 30% absolute emission reduction for a farmer with 1,000 acres of canola and 1,000 acres of wheat stands to have their profit reduced by approximately $38,000 to $40,000 per year. That would represent a loss of 400 million Canadian for wheat farmers and 396 million to 441 million for canola farmers. Fertilizer Canada also suggests that on reducing emissions per bushel and not using a total cap, if not, they warn that yield crop productivity will fall below 2020 levels. That's the other thing. The way that they're coming up with these reductions is going to affect this the yield size. So not only are they putting these arbitrary laws in place, they're even implementing them wrong. Okay, where was I? So, less food production might lead Canada to depend. Less food production might lead Canada to depend on food imports from countries relying on less sustainable agriculture practices. That is a huge, very important point. It, so, we're not going to be able to produce enough food. So, we're going to import food from countries that have no desire to follow any sort of greenhouse gas cap or anything. Like, they're burning coal, but yet Canada is okay with buying products from countries that burn coal, but we're not allowed to burn gas. Like, nothing, it's upside down world. And the mainstream media does not want to let you know. That's the most frustrating part. Um, They're supposed to be, like, unbiased. Not like me, I'm very biased. We cannot feed the uh, quote. We cannot feed the growing world population with a reduction in fertilizer, says the governments of Saskatchewan and Alberta. The UN warned earlier this year that global food production in 2023 may be unable to meet rising demand without proper fertilizer use. Um. Yeah. So. Um, Fertilizer price, uh, fertilizer prices through the roof. With Russia being the biggest global manufacturer of fertilizer, prices have doubled this year, according to the UN report. Farmers are already careful with their fertilizer use. Quote, producers are conservative in the use of fertilizer inputs and don't add more than what is needed. They alone simply cannot shoulder the impact of the short-sighted policy. Eastern Canada farmers um, are the most impacted as approximately 660 to 680,000 metric tons of nitrogen fertilizer are imported from Russia uh, sorry imported from Russia to the region annually. I mean I don't I mean I hate to say it but I am kind of glad at least it's Eastern Canada because Eastern Canada always votes liberal. So at least it's finally Eastern Canada dealing with Eastern Canadian politics. Furthermore, a swift 35%. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get into that part later. So, yeah, so, so like I said, Manitoba, um, yeah, Manitoba, this is coming. Um, Trudeau is implementing exactly what's going on in, du- in the Netherlands. He wants the, like I said, net zero by 2050. And right now, this up, he already put it through. The farmers are already dealing with that price increase, a 30% reduction. So, like, instead of, Letting you know what's happening instead of telling you the truth and letting you know what's coming to Canada. Um, this is <laughs> this is frustrating. This is the BS puff piece they come out with. Like farmers are struggling. They're like, I just read there they they could take like a forty thousand hit a dollar hit annually, and they're already like in the red. And remember. We're eating last year's crop. So this winter, when we have to eat this year's crop, when like like the uh, article explains, when the yields are less and at the same time more expensive um, to plant, to, to harvest, more expensive to operate just because gas prices are through the roof, um, price, like I said, food prices are going to be through the roof. But um, this is the puff piece they come out with. Growing crop of young farmers in Manitoba raises hope for future. 
Like nothing about food insecurity, nothing about Netherlands, nothing about how this cap is going to affect our farmers. Like it's clear that the governments are coming out against this in Western Canada. And they come out with this puff piece because they know that Ma- that, that Manitobans are talking about it. It's on social media. It's in you. It's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. We're all seeing like the videos and the photos and we're listening to our farmers complain about this and say what's coming. So CBC, instead of filming what they were there on the weekend, showing the rally, the convoy, this is what they come out with. Growing crop of young farmers in Manitoba raises hope for future. <laughs> like When Anastasia uh, Fick finished high school and left her family's farm, she never imagined she'd live there again. But after eight years abroad, concerns about climate change drew her back to western Manitoba and her family's land northwest of Dauphin, with the goal of finding more sustainable ways to produce food. And there it is. There was an article put out by Global, also citing that Manitoba has um, the highest rate of young farmers under the age of 35. But I wanted to highlight this because CBC, who, like I said, I keep saying, was at the rally but didn't put out an article. They now cover an article about farming, but they they want to put a spin on it to make sure it's about a more sustainable way to produce food. So, like, no, no, don't worry, guys. The 30% cap on fertilizer is not a problem because there's more sustainable ways to produce food. It's such a bullshit um, puff piece. So she's part of a rising number of young people in Manitoba taking up farming. Statistic, Statistics Canada says data from recently released 2021 census of agriculture says Manitoba had the highest proportion of farm operators under the age of 35 in Canada. 11.5% of Manitoba farmers are in that age range compared to the national average of 8.6%. So you can see by this chart as of Um, Like in 91, it slowly kept going down. And then in 2011 to 21, it's starting to go up. So she practices permaculture, a method of growing food that aims to match natural processes to maintain the health of the soil. The harmful impacts of industrial monocultural farming on the environment concerned Fike. But she also saw potential solutions in changing the way people grow food. Quote, we could be sequestering a lot more carbon by doing things like permaculture instead of annual agriculture, she said. The latest uh, stats showing a rise in young people farming in Manitoba is are encouraging, Fix said, but the sector still faces many challenges that are forcing more and more people out of the business. Like uh, putting a 30% cap on fertilizer, demanding that we be net zero by 2050, just an arbitrary year made up. And like it's it's such a joke. And here, like here, here it is, Manitoba. There were thirty four thousand seven hundred eighty farm operators in Manitoba in 1991, the first year Stats Canada collected comparable data in its agriculture census. That number declined every census period since, dropping to nineteen thousand four hundred sixty five in 2021. So there's the there's the like the hidden story. That, I mean, these farms still exist, but they're just not independently owned. It's just factory farms. The The family farm is disappearing, and that's a huge problem. But they don't talk about why. That's the, the most frustrating part. They'll point out that there's like 15,000 less family farms in Manitoba alone, but no, nothing on why. So despite the increase in number of younger farms, the average age of Manitoba farmers continues to get older, rising from 53 to 54. or So 53 in 2016 to now 54 in 2021. Stats Canada also reports an increase in the percentage of women operating farms in Manitoba from 23.8% in 2016 to 26.5% in 2021. Like, who cares? I don't care the, the sexuality, the race, the creed, the color the gender of who's producing my food, as long as they just do a good job. Like, why does that matter? It's ridiculous. I can't even read that quote. (laughs) It's so ridiculous. 
Those are encouraging signs in what has been difficult times for Manitoba farmers who endured a painful drought and grasshopper infested last summer, followed by an extended wet spring that delayed seeding. Buckle up, lady, because Trudeau is out to get you. It's just going to get harder and harder to farm in Canada. So, yeah, they go on to highlight another farmer, but you guys get the point. It's just farming is good and farming is awesome, but (laughs) they don't talk about the issues and what's causing these issues. That's, like I said, the most frustrating part. But, um, unfortunately, like, uh, I I stopped reading this article because I have another one pulled up. But the troubles that our government is causing our farmers doesn't end at at this artificial, arbitrary cap on fertilizer. That's coming, like, next year. But Justin Trudeau, in, in his mighty wisdom, is also right now putting tariffs on fertilizer right now which directly hits our farmers that hurt that hurts our farmers pocketbooks directly oh shit i just um deleted the article i was gonna pull up okay give me a second minute until i gotta pull it up Okay, what do I need? Okay, give me a second. Okay, that sucks. I literally X'd out. Here it is. All right, we're back in business, Manitoba. Ontario farmers say Canada's fertilizer tariff punishes them, punishes them for Russian's war. And this is so true. Fertilizer was hit with new general tariffs in March, leaving no time to pivot for 2022 growing season. That's the other thing. Justin Trudeau did it like two weeks before planting season, I believe. And farmers already purchased their seeds and plant everything out months ahead. So, like, like I said, how he's implementing everything is not thought through. Like, there's no concept of the future. As the federal government continues its efforts to punish Russia economically for its invasion of Ukraine, Ontario agriculture groups and representatives of Canada's fertilizer sector are warning that cash crop farmers and consumers are the ones bearing the cost. In March, Finance Minister Christia Freeland, who's silent on Dutch, uh, on the Netherlands and the Dutch farmers, and International Trade Minister Mary Ng, I don't know how to pronounce that last name, Uh, announced that in retaliation for Russia's illegal invasion, Canada was imposing a 35% general tariff on virtually all Russian imports, including nitrogen fertilizer that Eastern Canadian growers rely on to boost crop yields. So they're also putting tariffs on the fertilizer, which is directly used to boost crop yields. Like I said, less food, more expensive. That's a problem. The timing, mere weeks from the start of planting season, couldn't have been worse. Farmers make often risky decisions about what crops to grow and place order place orders for seeds and fertilizers months in advance. Russia has been a reliable source. Uh, sorry, yeah, Russia has been a reliable source of nitrogen shipments. Before the tariffs were imposed, it was exporting 660 tons. I, I read that already. That's about 85 to 90 percent of the total fertilizer applied. So Justin Trudeau's putting tariffs on like 90% of our farmers out east use Russian fertilizer. Around one-third of the 2022 shipments have not been delivered into Ontario 
yet when that tariff was applied, and some of those ships are even being told that they would have to turn around, said Ryan Kostleg, Executive Director of Ontario Bean Growers, and he represents roughly 1,100 farmers growing approximately 100,000 acres of dry crops like white or black beans. Fertilizer prices are a major input cost for already low-margin cash crop operations. A 35% hike in this tariff, when combined with farmers' already already inflated energy and gasoline bills, puts a lot of upward pressure on commodity prices. That's why Costlick's organization, along with the Grain Farmers of Ontario, the Ontario Canola Growers, the Atlantic Grains Council, the uh, Lay of Producteurs du Grains du Quebec, I butchered that. A half a dozen other farm groups from Eastern Canada and fertilizer industry representatives called on the federal government again this week to reconsider. I hope they remember this come voting season. But the East always votes liberal. Quote, take a second look at it. Determine if this is ultimately the outcome that they wanted to achieve with applying this tariff and then compare that to with what we're seeing as being an inflation inflationary problem in the grocery store very well said take a look at the tariffs and see how it's affecting russia and see how it's affecting your own population and if it's hurting your own population more maybe you shouldn't have them the group says that the government won't rebate the cost of the tariff it it should invest in expanding the domestic supply of fertilizer so growers aren't in this situation again next year like i mean A seven-year-old would come up with that, but Justin Trudeau, he doesn't think like that. Canada has been uh, Canada has a natural gas resource to become self-sufficient in fertilizer if the government invests in domestic nitrogen production. Following a meeting of federal, provincial, and territorial ministers of agriculture in Saskatoon on Friday, agriculture and ag minister uh, Bibo said the government was investing in the fertilizer industry by funding research and innovation and helping farmers find new suppliers. So they're, f- they're helping out by, uh, by researching. How the fuck does that help us now? While modern farm techniques such as cover crops and crop rotation can help reduce bulk fertilizer use, not all growers can pivot on a dime, Caustic said. Natural nitrogen sources such as livestock manures also have been targeted by the federal government's climate change policies. Real fast, Manitoba, he complains about cow farts, as I know it's funny to say, but he he truly does. Um, but just real fast, Google a photo of all the airplanes flying over Canada at any given time. And, and they want to talk about farms. Like, there, there's, <laughs> it, it's, like, it's a joke. It truly really is a joke. Um... Quote, it's hard to be a green farmer when you're operating in the red, Koslick said. When farmers can't afford optimum levels of fertilizer, they may apply less to their fields and resign themselves to lower crop yields. Like, everyone's saying this, but Justin Trudeau ain't listening. And where's Heather Stephenson? Like, why the fuck is she silent on this? Meanwhile, a bumper crop of plant proteins and grains from Canadian producers could help to address food insecurity and supply chain challenges resulting from Ukraine's lost acres and blocked exports. Here's another important thing. Quote, tariffs and retaliation and sanctions are the most effective when you can devise policies that have the maximum impact on the counterparty whose attention you are seeking to get and do the minimal damage to yourself, Freeland said one week after Russia invaded and two days before slapping on the tariffs last winter. So our (laughs) Christy Freeland... What, what, I forgot what minister she is. Understood what the point of a tariff is to hurt your opponent more than it hurts you. Time to reevaluate. Even at the early stage, she warned that the war was likely to hurt Canada's economy. This is government imposed problems. This doesn't have to be like this. This, this is government imposed. The fertilizer tariff could be making Canada's crop less competitive on the world market during a period of relative scarcity, holding back economic growth. Like I said, this should be the time 
when we're producing more food. Here's a very another important fact, Manitoba. Other G7 allies didn't target fertilizer, th- making this exemption request different from those uh, involving sanctions that were closely coordinated among Western democracies. Quote, the United States is not applying a tariff. The UK and France are not applying a tariff. Why is Canada... Why is it that Canada is the one that's forcing our farmers to pay for the cost of the war in Ukraine? Very well said. No no other G7 country is imposing a tariff on fertilizer. Just like no other country is imposing travel restrictions and mask mandates, but Justin Trudeau, our dictator, is. Like, wake up, Manitoba. Um... Okay, so here's another. While Germany's request to Canada for sanctions exemption to permit the return of a natural gas turbine for Russia's Nord Stream 1 pipeline was approved, a controversial decision that's now the subject of upcoming parliamentary hearings triggered by official opposition, farm groups have yet to have any response to the request for a reprieve. Another very important point, Justin Trudeau is willing to go back on his tariffs. He was holding the, that turbine. And Russia's like, oh, really? And then put a little bit of pressure on Germany, who relies on Russia heavily. And um, Canada went back on the sanctions, and they gave Russia the turbine back. And to make it legal, they just gave Germany the turbine, and then Germany gave it to Russia. So Justin Trudeau and his government is very capable of going back on these tariffs if it's not the right thing to do. And it's obviously hurting our farmers more. But, um, no, nothing. Like, nothing from him. It, it's it's mind-blowing. And also, another thing, Justin Trudeau is putting, like I said, all these restrictions on our farmers, um, putting all these tariffs on Russia, Going back on his own tariffs when he, he gets a little bit of pressure put him put on him on the world stage, he could care less about what can, Canadians think and about uh, Canada and, and our opinion. But when the leaders on the world stage put a little bit of pressure on him, this motherfucker is a globalist. He backs he backs down, and he'll give the turbine back. But he but Justin Trudeau is doing this. When he has no faith, Russia will uphold deal to export Ukrainian grain. So in a time of food scarcity, an agreement that would allow, I'll read this, an agreement that would allow the export of millions of tons of Ukrainian grain amid a global food crisis. Justin Trudeau doesn't think that Russia is going to pull through on the deal that just signed. Justin Trudeau is still hurting Canadian farmers. And just not letting go of these tariffs, letting go of this this cap on fertilizer that's going to yield less, le- like less yield. He's he's fucking this over. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is not convinced that Russia will hold uphold its end to deal um, of the deal to reopen Ukrainian Black Sea ports to grain experts. Russia and Ukraine uh, signed a separate agreements Friday with Turkey and the United Nations, clearing the way to export millions of tons of desperately needed Ukrainian grain, as well as Russian grain and fertilizer. But he has zero faith it's going to happen. When asked on Friday if he trusted Russia to uphold its end of the deal, Trudeau said he had next to no faith in Ma- Moscow. Canada's confidence in Russia's re- reliability is pretty much nil. They have demonstrated nothing but poor faith, Trudeau told reporters during a media availability. So Russia and Ukraine, both among the world's biggest exporters of food, sent their defense and infrastructure ministers respectively to Istanbul to take part in the signing ceremony, the two sides said. So, like I said, Justin Trudeau has zero faith that uh, Putin's going to uphold his end of the deal. So don't you think that would be the time where Justin Trudeau maybe um, helps out Canadian farmers? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, nothing's making sense what he's doing. It's 
mind blowing. Um, but um, so not only on the national stage, this like like I said throughout the show, where's Heather? Like there was a hundred vehicle convoy on the weekend, and our prime our our premier was silent on it. We have a food insecurity crisis coming, and she was out at the Manitoba Stampede, which is cool. I'm all for that, but nothing on the convoy, nothing on the Netherlands, nothing on the food insecurity problem, nothing on the fertilizer cap. On the tariffs, nothing. She's silent. Our elected officials are all silent. You know another more more frustrating. Like I mean, it's frustrating because Heather Stevenson is our premier, so she should be very vocal about this. But Wab Canoe, silent. And this is his pinned tweet. I'm gonna try and play this. I hope you guys could hear it. Like I said, Manitoba, we just had a hundred vehicle convoy, ten semis, five tractors, in regards to the Dutch protesting the fertilizer cap, which is going to directly affect food prices. Pay attention. Store, we got teenagers at home. We're all dealing with the rising cost of food increase this year, and then of course when we head to the meat counter, chicken prices up twice within a month. Beef prices still high. Meanwhile, the average rancher, the average producer. Hey, Sorry, we're guys. all dealing with the rising cost of food. We're feeling the pain at the grocery store. We got teenagers at home. We go through a lot of corn pops. Cereal prices are up by a dollar this year. Even if you're trying to do healthier than that and eat your veggies, produce costs are up 10% this year. Plus, you've got to cook them. Cooking oil costs, whether it's fancy stuff like this one or canola oil, 30% increase this year. And then, of course, when we head to the meat counter, Chicken prices up twice within a month. Beef prices still high. Meanwhile, the average rancher, the average producer, is not getting a heck of a lot more money this year than they have in the past. So what is going on? That's why today we're calling on the PC government to form an all-party committee to make your grocery costs cheaper. Let's get to work through the summer to make your life more affordable. This summer, 2022, we're saying put the politics aside and let's work through the summer for you and make your life more affordable. Hey, where, where were you this weekend, Canoe? Hey, Wob, where the fuck were you when hundreds of Manitobans were out protesting to make our food cheaper? Silence from all our elected officials, the PCs, the NDP, the Liberals. Unfortunately, guys, Glenn Murray... Sorry about it if you guys, I don't know if you guys can hear my dog going crazy barking. Um, Glenn Murray, Scott Gillingham, who else? Uh, Jenny Mokalak, all these candidates for Winnipeg Mayor, Sean Looney for Winnipeg. They were all at the Fringe Festival or Folklorama or there was um, some beach volleyball tournament or something. Which again, I'm all for it, but where the fuck were they? And if they don't want to show up, at least f talk about it. Like, all our elected officials are silent. I hate to say it, a lot of our hopeful elected officials are silent. On what is essentially the most important aspect to our life, food insecurity. This alone, these tariffs and um, the, this net zero bullshit by 2050 may not hit Canada right away. But this definitely is going to cause millions of people to die. Trudeau will not talk about that. Our media definitely will not mention that. In third world countries, I mean, the war obviously is affecting it too. But this is going to cost millions of people to die. So, I mean, it, it's kind of disappointed that um, I was expecting someone who is running for mayor of the city of Winnipeg would have been there on the weekend, but uh, no, radio silence from everyone, from our mainstream media to our elected officials. Now, Manitoba, I know I've talked about this group a lot because, I mean, they're really the only ones that give me hope. This is a grassroots 
party, I believe. And um, they at least come out and mention this stuff and talk about it. They're not afraid to mention these words. So I will, I am going to end this show with, we do, like I said, move over PCs, liberals, NDP. You guys are just career politicians. The second you get elected, you're just in it for your party, for yourself first to get reelected and then in it for your party second. You guys never say my bad, I'm wrong, the other team had a good idea. I'm done with it, Te- I'm team politics, and I know they are a party, but I hope they stay true, but they are a party of grassroots, like just farmers, nurses, cops, tradespeople. You know what I mean? So anyways, Manitoba, I'm going to leave you with this. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, let me just, uh, I want to be able to pull it up full screen. Have a listen. Farmers. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Friesen, leader of the Keystone Party of Manitoba. Farmers in Manitoba are some of the world's best grain, poultry, eggs, hogs, cattle, milk, potato, and you name it, producers in the world. That's right, I said in the world. It's a fact that our federal government has targeted these industries, and Trudeau has taken his destructive sites from the oil and gas industry and set them on, you guessed it, farmers. For me, this hits way too close to home. What's even more concerning is that our provincial government has said nothing. Other provinces have already spoke out against this, but ours is eerily quiet. I, as one of these producers, will not sit quiet. We, as Manitoba farmers, are some of the most sophisticated, regenerative, and environmentally friendly farmers in Canada. Is this the thanks we get for supplying the world with some of the best ingredients? Where is our Premier, and where is our Ag Minister? This is serious trouble for our province, especially after food producers on every side are spending more than ever on their input. We, the Keystone Party of Manitoba, stand with the farmers and oppose the nitrogen-limiting madness. I encourage you to investigate for yourself how producers in our province have invested in technologies like variable rate fertilizing, manure injection, and other state-of-the-art methods in order to be efficient and excellent conservationists. I really encourage you to talk about this with your friends and family, and I plead with powers in our province, especially in the legislature today, to act. Now is the time to act, Manitoba. All right. So the Keystone Party of Manitoba finally someone willing to at least speak up for our farmers you know what i mean like just for manitobans in general it's i don't know like like he pointed out why is heather stephenson silent on it other provinces have spoken up but yet heather stephenson she's just going down the same path um pallister went down and uh, you know i i really hate when people say like they're already co- like they were saying it in the federal election, like a vote for PC is a throwaway vote, but it's just simply not true. A conser- like conservatives don't govern conservatively, so a conservative vote is a liberal vote. A PPC vote is a conservative vote, and that's it. That's the only conservative party we have in Canada, and I believe in twenty twenty three. The same thing is going to be true for our provincial politics. People are going to say it, um, a, a keystone vote is a throwaway vote, but I'm just going to go ahead and say that that's not true. Uh, a PC vote is is like a liberal vote, or I should say an NDP vote, because they're killing it in the province, which is not good. But like I said... um. Heather Stephenson, Brian Pallister, they don't govern conservatively. So it's not a throwaway vote. If you are a conservative and you want to vote conservatively, vote Keystone. 
And I know they're not trying to claim right wing, I believe, but they definitely are. Go look at their 10 principles, their 10 guiding principles of the party. And um, I'm sure a lot of you guys listening will pretty much agree, I don't know, with probably all of them. But Manitoba, just so you guys know also real fast, <laughs> this um, my goal is to do Monday, Wednesday, Fridays at 7 o'clock, do these live shows. But I'm all over the map. This is only my second one, and uh, it's a disaster. So thank you guys for watching. But um, I actually recorded like a... F I did this show. It was like 40 minutes. I published it and realized there was no sound. So... It's a little bit of a learning curve, Manitoba, so thanks for tuning in. But like I said, I do want to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So definitely come back Friday, and we'll see uh, if I can get a little bit better at this. But either way, Manitoba, like, share, subscribe, do all that good stuff that helps out the show. I really do appreciate it. Like I said, MB Freethinker for TikTok and um, Twitter, Manitoba Freethinker podcast for Facebook, YouTube. And I think it's MB Freethinker for Rumble. Actually, I'm on a shitload of social media platforms. Liberty, I've been on that one for a while. Um, on I'm on Minds, obviously Rumble, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. Oh, go to mbfreethinker.wordpress.com, and if if you want the audio only show. But uh, that's it. That's it, Manitoba. I love you guys so much, and I will uh, check you guys on Friday. Bye.